whole sequence of events that Abraham and Isaac had to go through. And if you remember about uh, Abraham and Isaac, Abraham had to wait, he stood in, in faith for many years until he managed to get his son, didn't he? Because his wife had been barren. And, uh, and so they were well over 90 years of age when they had this son. And so he was miraculous. And uh, it's a picture to us of when God gives us a vision. He gives us a vision of what it is that he's called us to do. And you will not be found that it will take a long time for that vision to come into being. And so there will be a long period of time when you are praying, when you are standing in faith. And when many times it looks just the opposite mm. is taking place. Yeah. Um, last week I, I prophesied that God had opened up a window in heaven. Uh, and uh, grace and uh, faith will go before you. And for some of you, you've had the opposite take place. And uh, uh, I know your laptop bit the dust, didn't you? <clears throat> and uh, I never got a chance to say to you. Um, after God releases a prophecy, don't be surprised when the opposite happens. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember in the parable of the sower, uh, it talks about when the seed is um, it's sown, that the birds come to steal mm -hmm. the seed, don't they? And so when a prophetic word is delivered, the enemy does his best to try and stop it. Mm. Uh, and so one of the keys with prophecy, when you receive a prophecy, is that you need to war a good war with that prophecy. Mm. You have to pray the prophecy into being. Mm. It doesn't just happen. And so you have to take hold of that prophetic word and you have to pray it. Mm. You have to pray that, you have to claim it, you have to <coughs> thank the Lord for it, for it to come and take place. Yeah. And so don't be surprised when the word of the Lord is released to you and then every, all hell is let loose, mm. right? And it looks completely the opposite to what's been yeah. spoken. Mm. Uh, but <clears throat> once you understand the ways of the spirit realm, you can be encouraged because mm. that should confirm to you that that was a true word that was given to you mm. because of the resistance that's coming against you, yes. mm. you see. Mm. And so be encouraged, take all of those prophetic words, don't let go of them. That is a sword that God has given to you for you to fight in a particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's vitally important you understand those principles. Prophecy, you see, a lot of people seem to think that a prophetic word delivered to them is actually more powerful than the word of God. Mm -hmm. You see, if, if you think that that prophetic word is just going to happen because it's been spoken to you, you're actually saying it's, it's above the Word of God. Mm. Because the Word of God, it says, is a more sure word of prophecy, mm. isn't it? And that doesn't just happen. You have to pray it into being, don't you? Mm. You have to call those things that be not as of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do just that with the prophetic word as well. So take all of it and pray it into being, and you will surely see it come to pass. Mm. Hallelujah. Well, this is what Abraham had to do, mm. didn't he? Uh, with Isaac, and so yeah. it was 25 years before he saw Isaac be born. Mm -hmm. And there's a danger when your vision takes that long for it to come into being, and then when you've got it, you could love that vision, especially Abraham loving Isaac. He could yeah. love Isaac yeah. so much mm. because of what he's had to go through, the yeah. faith that he's had to exert to see Isaac come forth. Mm. You can love him so much that without realising it, <clears throat> it can become an idol. Mm -hmm. It can start to become more important to you than, uh, what do you do for me on the floor? <clears throat> Hello. It can become more important to you <clears throat> than being obedient to God. Mm. And so this is one of the things that you've got to be careful with. Uh, with your ministry, with, with your life, with those things that you're praying about, that it doesn't become more important to you. And you see, God has always got a way of testing your heart. The way of testing whether something is becoming an idol is God comes along and says, I want you to give it away. I want you to kill it. I, I, want, I want you to let go of it. And that's the test in your heart. You see, whether now has it become more important to you than being obedient to God? And you know, God's done that with me a couple of times in these churches where I've had to be willing to let go of them. 
and uh, at the time it was so painful I, I had to um, actually go through a period where I thought that that was it the churches were finished all, all, all the effort I put in all the time that we'd spent everything that we'd done uh, it, it, it all gone and I, I knew later on as I was seeking the Lord as to what was taking place at that time as well as there being various battles and things that we were going through there was also a test of my heart whether I was willing to let go uh, of those things and so don't be surprised in, in um, seeing your vision come into manifestation that uh, there might be a time when that vision dies and it can be really painful but the fact is that God is doing that to test your heart now one of the, the consequences of going through that and being found faithful is that God can actually increase the size of that vision you see the vision the, the, the size of the vision that you've got at that time if you are willing to let go of that God mm -hmm. multiplies yeah. that and so the vision instead of being one now it could be hundred it could be a thousand times as large as your original vision. And so these are some of the ways that God works in our hearts. Hallelujah. So you have to sacrifice it. And this is exactly what God asked of Abraham. Um, he asked him to go and sacrifice his son. And he actually told him to go and do it, didn't he? And so from that time... As he was travelling towards this mountain, on his heart <laughs> is this this thought that he's got to let go of his son. Mm. And we know that Abraham got to the point where he believed that even if he killed his son, that God was able to resurrect him. We know we he come, come to that place in his heart. His faith in God was so strong because he knew that all of the destiny that was coming after him was to come through his son because mm. God had said that yes. he told him that yes. he said he wasn't going to go through uh, the son of Hagar mm. he was going to go through this son mm. and so he knew that this son needed to still be alive mm. and so if God had told him to kill him to sacrifice him God must be intended to bring him back from the dead mm. and so that was what enabled him to go all the way through that to, um, that period of time hallelujah <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to that as we're going along but I want to uh, secondly look at this whole concept of the mountain that God sent him to a particular place didn't he and in the past I've touched on this I've said that uh, if Abraham hadn't been accurate in obeying what God told him he could have thought well I could go to any mountain he's told me to go and sacrifice my son on a mountain but God didn't say on a mountain, he said on a particular mountain. And, and that mountain uh, has particular significance with Israel because Mount Moriah was later changed its name to Mount Calvary. And it was also the place where the temple was built. And so you see, this is the first time that you see that this particular area is a special place to God. And there's <clears throat> something called a trysting place, T-R-Y-S-T. Uh, and to tryst, it means to, uh, uh, to have an encounter with God. And so in your life, you might find that there might be a particular place that is really special to you in your relationship with God. It might be a place where you find it much easier to be close to God. It doesn't mean to say that that place is technically a place where it is easier for you to be with God. It's just that that is how it seems to with you. For me, because of the encounter I had with God, there's a big hill in Compton called the Cloud. And... Uh, that's where I had my day of an encounter with the Lord. And so that place, uh, I've been back there several times, many times. Not so much lately, but certainly in the early years, any time I was struggling, I used to go up the cloud. Because uh, I, I seemed to think I, I could uh, hear him more clearly. Nowadays, I, I can hear him clearly enough, so I don't have to go climb up the cloud. 
I certainly don't have to go climb up snow nor uh, uh, Ben Nevy. So, are those three beasts? Uh, they were they were hard work. They were, but a trysting place. <coughs> and so, this is like a trysting place. Um, it's the beginnings of this special uh, connection that Israel has with Mount Moriah. Uh, and so, Abraham takes him up there. Uh, and this whole concept of a mountain, what I want you to think about. Uh, again, I've touched on this in the past, and I've told you that uh, um, there are some very well known men of God that uh, are teaching about the seven mountains. Uh, and so you'll, you'll find we've got them here. I'll pull this off a website for you, and I'll put a website address uh, in blue a little bit further down, so that if you're really interested in this, that you can go on that website and you can start to do a bit of research. But the whole concept was that uh, Bill Bright, who was uh, uh, founder of Campus Crusade, uh, and Lauren Cunningham, who was the founder of Youth with a Mission, they both had a simultaneous uh, message come to them from God. And that message was that if you want to change your culture, the way that you're going to have to do it is that you're going to have to reach seven mountains in the culture. And that those seven mountains are these. <clears throat> the area of business, the area of government, the area of media, the area of arts, the area of entertainment, the area of education, the area of the family, and the area of religion. And it's very easy in a church to, to get the idea that the only real spiritual calling is into religion, into the church, being a full-time minister. And, and that can be portrayed, uh, and, and that's a wrong concept because the reality is there's only about 5% of the church that ever become full-time ministers, uh, and a lot less than that get paid. Um, and so there's very few people that become full-time ministers of God. Um, and so, does that mean to say that you're not as important, that you have got a calling? Well, that's not true at all. That every one of us, we've got a calling. And part of the challenge is for us to find out which are the mountains that we are called to. Which are these areas that God wants us to be in, where we are going to start to change the culture. Because part of what I believe that God has wanted to do with us, to raise you up as leaders, um, to get you to be able to hear from God so that you can go out into whatever area that you are called to and that you can be Jesus in that place. So if it's in nursing, you go into the nursing uh, and, and where there might be lots of people that treat it as a job, uh, it's nine to five and they just go home uh, and they don't care for people, you know, they might be chewing gum and uh, and watching the, the phone and so on, uh, and, and, and then nipping off to look at somebody, and not, not speaking to them, not caring for them, not even treating them like a human being, yeah. not praying for them, you know, even if it's under your breath. But you could be the opposite, and you could, because originally nursing, uh, all hospitals, they were at the side of churches. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only thing that they got to work with was the love of God and prayer. They didn't have any uh, medicines or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, so many people, what they actually need is an atmosphere of love and care where they can recuperate. Where their body heals itself uh, and that they are in an atmosphere that's going to help that. Mm -hmm. And the sad fact is that our National Health Service now has gone so far away from that because it was, it was taken over by the, the, the money men, wasn't it? The, the managers, the accountants, the penny pinchers, uh, and uh, instead of having matrons that were running uh, hospitals mm -hmm. um, and, and the doctors, it was the money men that were running them. Yeah. And so he went completely the other way around, didn't he? Yeah. You see? Uh, and so that, that's an example of how, if that's your calling, you can move in the spirit realm in that particular area in your career to reach those people. Uh, and, uh, and it might not be that you, you get them at the church. It might be that you work, your hospital is a distance away from where your church is, but you are still ministering in that situation, you see. <clears throat> and as a part of the concept of the mountain, 
It, it is that the enemy seeks to encamp on the top of the mountain so uh, that Satan is the one that uh, has the authority over that mountain. And so this is the whole principle of how to change a culture. How to change this culture, it isn't just having big churches. You can have big churches, but if the people in those churches aren't getting into those mountains, what will happen is that you'll be having a wonderful time of worship in the church, but the, the country's going to pop. And so what we need is, we need people that are climbing up the mountains, getting into places of authority on each of those different mountains. So that what started to take place is that uh, the culture on those mountains is starting to change. Now, the Islamics have understood this and they have put this into operation a lot better than the church has. You see? And that's why they are now being able to exert as much influence in this country and in other countries as they are doing. They've used this principle, you see. In the background, they've been ferreting away. Uh, and they've been studying and, and they've been rising up in, into those places where they make decisions. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. You see the number of uh, Asian type ladies that are on the television now as announcers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just waiting for the first one. Where's a hijab or whatever you call it? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, because you can see it. Mm -hmm. You see? And so, uh, in terms of us praying, we have to understand uh, it's not enough for us to pray, but we've got to go as well. Yes. You see, mm. if you're praying about the culture of a particular mountain, mm. somebody's got to go to that mountain. Mm. Somebody's got to go in there and somebody's got to start to climb up that mountain mm. so that they can be the one that starts to make the decisions. Mm. Otherwise, the church, we can be praying, we, we can, but there's nobody that's actually there on the front. You see, and so... Um, we, we will touch on this again, we'll keep coming back to this old concept, uh, but I want to spend a little bit more time on it today so that you can see <coughs> uh, where I'm coming from. Because we don't want to be just uh, in, technically in, in brackets spiritual people. We want to be powerful people. We want to be people that actually change things. Amen. And so one of the things I've talked to Linda about going into Ghana uh, is, is thinking, actually what's causing? Um, the, the number of orphans that, that are there. Rather than just going in and trying to solve the problem of the orphans, think to yourself, what's causing that? Because you need to pray about that and put in some kind of strategy that starts to, to stop the, or, the number of orphans. You see, it's not like um, there was a story about a guy that uh, stuck his finger into the, the dam because there was a little leak and, and he put his finger in to stop it from leaking. Well, that's a short-term answer, isn't it? The long-term answer is to fix the dam, yeah. you see. And so the seven mountains thing, th this is more to do with the church actually accepting its responsibility mm -hmm. of running the country, of governing. Mm -hmm. Understand that we should be the, the governors of this country, that those that are righteous, those that are, uh, have got the, in, uh, the best intentions for this country, rather than those that are corrupt, that want to uh, take the, the country for as much money as they can, uh, and abuse the power. Uh, and so the Christians are the ones that should be at the top, but they aren't. Uh, and the sad reason is because a, a lot of the, uh, what you would call them, uh, the, the born again, uh, Holy Spirit filled Christians, seem to think the only place that they can um, be powerful is in the church, you see. Uh, and so I want you to see that. Okay, so we're going to move on to worship, <coughs> verse 5. Um, he said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now that's the way to be in faith, isn't it? You know, you've been told to go and kill your son, and he says to his servants, stay here, we're going to go over there, we're going to worship, meet my son, uh, as a part of that, the act of worship, I've got to kill him, but then we, we're both going to come back. Mm -hmm. You see, that, that, that's how you speak faith, you know, it's not... Well, I'll be coming back, and I'm hoping he's going to come with me, you know, joking. Uh, I'm only joking, son, you are coming... And it's ever so easy for us to get drawn into that, isn't it? Mm, yeah. 
in joking, I used to be terrible at it. You don't realise the negative stuff that comes out of your mouth and you, you, you try and twist it by saying, I'm only joking. Mm. Well, there was a time when the Lord said to me, Graham, do you want to be a joker or do you want to be a prophet? <laughs> and, and I mean, he was being serious with me. It was like, the time for joking is, is, is over because you need to start to speak my word and people need to understand that when you're speaking my word, you mean it. Yeah. You know, you're not going to retract it in five minutes saying it's just a joke. Uh, and so it's important now. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he built an altar at the place God told him to. We could spend a whole message on building altars. But uh, that was an aspect of it. Part of what I want to get across to you today is this act of worship had to cost him something. Uh, and you know I've mentioned it in um, the church nowadays um, the worship service could actually be uh, a song service and there's actually no cost to it now thankfully the, the way that we go about things there is still lots of time for you to start up songs um, and there's still an element of cost in that that if you are starting a song on your own with no music behind you um, and, and your voice uh, isn't as strong as other people's um, you've got to get past uh, all the thoughts that are there to stop you from doing it and that's a part of the cost of it and that's what makes it so valuable to God and the fact that you are willing to do that it makes it an act of worship and, and worship, for it to be worship uh, you have to understand that it was an old English word that was worth shit. Hello, can we help you? One credit. Credit. Thank you. Let's get back out again. The old English word worth shit. In other words, something that has worth, something of value. For it to be a sacrifice, it's got to be of value. Something that is worth something, mm -hmm. you see. And so the danger in uh, many churches is that what's taking place is the only sacrifice is taking place with the praise and worship team. Who are spending time asking God um, what songs he wants us to sing. And they're spending time practicing them. And so when they bring the songs, they bring a sacrifice and everybody else just sings along. Well, it, it can be worse than that. Apparently in America, and I don't know if it's taking a place here, but in America what happens is a lot of people go to church now and they watch the praise and worship team sing. And they don't sing. And so they have, they have videos of congregations that are sitting there watching them sing. They become an audience. Mm. Right? They're not a congregation. Mm. And so it, they think that they're going to church and they're going to a worship service, but they're not. Because it's cost them nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I've, I've taught the praise and worship team to be aware of that. You see, and that's why we, we always have a, a lot of space between the songs. So that you can bring your worship. Mm -hmm. right? That you have got an opportunity to bring mm -hmm. something. It costs you something. You see, you're having to think. You're having to seek words that you can be singing to God. So that you haven't got words just on there that you can just uh, repeat. That you're having to dig. You're having to start to uh, find some words that, to describe God, to, to, uh, to give to God. And so there's some cost to it. Okay? Hallelujah. Yes, you think about it as well. With this particular situation, the cost that Abraham was asked to pay his son, it meant that he wasn't going to forget that. Now, in lots of churches, Sunday after Sunday, they could um, merge back into a little sort of a grey sense of church. And one Sunday could be no different to the next. And so you could find that if you look back over that year, <coughs> nothing stands out to you at all. <coughs> in terms of the meetings being memorable, they could fade easily. But believe me, this day, <laughs> in Abraham's life, because of the cost 
of his worship, yeah. he wasn't going to forget it. Yeah. You see? Now, if any of us come to the point where God says to you, I want you to give a thousand pound as an offering over and above your tithes, right? I'm pretty certain you'd remember that day. Yeah. Oh, man. Wouldn't you? Yeah. I remember uh, one preacher saying he was in Kenneth Hagin's uh, camp meeting and the Lord said to him, I want you to give $10,000. And he said he started to sweat. And he turned to the guy next to him and he says, um, are you supposed to give $10,000? He says, why? He says, well, I've just heard that I was supposed to give $10,000. And I was wondering if it was for you. <laughs> and, and so he was sweating. And eventually he gave it. Hallelujah. Amen. And then he never forgot that day. Mm. Right? So in terms of worship, have this whole understanding of things being memorable. Because you see, for God, how memorable is it for God? Mm. You know, I could teach you on things called memorial offerings, where it talks about the offering being brought back as a memorial to God. There's some people that um, on television, in terms of trying to get you to give, that they will call something a memorial offering. You see, but that whole concept that it's got to be valuable, it's got to have some cost, some meaning to you, in terms of worship. You see, so when you're coming on a Sunday, um, and what you're putting into those particular offerings, that's one aspect of it. What you give as a testimony is another aspect of it as well, isn't it? But you don't have to limit it to Sunday because some of the most powerful and costly offerings might be during the week. Yeah. When God asks you to go to somebody, you know, to go do something for somebody, wherever it might be, that, that might be an offering and you never tell the church. And that's got to be one of the things as well. You, you've got to recognise um, the, the things that you have to share with the church and the things that you're not. Because there's a danger we get into boasting. Amen. And so some of the things that God calls you to do, they are for you to do, yeah. and minister to that person, and not share with anybody. Yes, amen. You see, so that's an aspect that you've got to take into consideration. What parts uh, can I give glory to God about? Mm -hmm. Which other parts, they're, they're personal. I'm not supposed to share them at all. Mm. Amen. How? Yes, God. So Abraham's prophecy, verse 8. After Isaac said, now Isaac's waking up, right? They're going up this mountain to offer this, uh, th this sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And he's looking around and he's thinking, uh, I've seen the wood, I've seen the knife, I've seen the fire, but I can't see the lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, so he says, Dad, where, where's the lamb? <laughs> yeah. Now he might have already gotten down and thought, hang on, he's, he, he's going to sacrifice me. I'm the sacrifice. And so Isaac is looking for the lamb. He's looking for a saviour. He's looking for somebody that's going to help him out in this situation because if he sees that steely glint in his dad's eyes, you know, that God's told him to sacrifice me and it looks like he's going to do it. You know, if I recognise that every time he's looked like that before, he's done those things and it looks to me as though he might well do it. So I need a saviour. I need some help here because my dad's going to kill me. Mm. I don't know how many people have said that, you know, when they've been out too late and they've drunk far too, too much the night before. The night before and they say to them, my dad's going to kill me when I get home. Well, this dad was going to kill me. Right? Yeah. And so he needed a saviour. Yeah. And so one of the concepts I was looking at uh, over the weekend, uh, and I didn't get a chance to really dig in it as much as I wanted, but <clears throat> it's the whole concept of what is God. And in most cultures, God, a God, is someone that is a protector and a provider. So you'll come ac across this concept that gods are protectors and providers. Why would you need a god? 
And in our culture, that's what people are basically saying. Why do we need a God? <coughs> the only time they need a God is when they come up against the situation where they can't provide for themselves or they can't protect themselves. And now they're faced with, who's going to help me? And in our culture, what they try to do is make the state to be your protector, your provider. And that's what the, uh, the health, what we call it, you know, the um, social, secu social security and all that kind of stuff. Mm. In the background, that is sort of taking the place of God. And so because of that, very few people come to that place of destitution where they have to cry out to God. There's only God that can help you, you see. And so that aspect of the state, whilst it appears to be good, it actually keeps a lot of people away from salvation. And so God has protecting and God has providing. And this particular message is more specifically on God has provided, Jehovah Jireh. But you've got to see that the two fit together because as we go a little bit further down, you, I want to show you that so many times the God's way of provision is first he has to protect you. Mm. Right? Mm. So uh, Abraham's prophecy, his answer to his son is, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Mm. Now look at those words because those words are very, very accurate. When he's, because it says God will provide himself. Oh, yes, amen. Glory. Mm. He, he said, I'm going to actually become the lamb. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come down to earth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to actually become that lamb for you at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. Amen. amen. And he was able to do that because Abraham prophesied that accurately. He amen. said exactly what God asked him to say. Mm -hmm. He spoke those words, mm -hmm. and those words enabled Jesus to come. Mm -hmm. Now, if Abraham hadn't said that, God would have had to inspire somebody else to say something exactly like that. Amen. Because, you see, Jesus could only come when all the prophetic words have been released. Amen. Because Amen. Jesus was the word of God. Amen. And so to come as the word of God, it had to already have been spoken, mm -hmm. you Amen. see. So when this was spoken, he was speaking at that moment in time to his son, right, in terms of um, words of faith so that he would keep his son. He didn't realise that what he was actually doing was he was putting in motion a spiritual set of laws that enabled Jesus to come uh, as the saviour for the whole world. And that happened because of that one statement there. That's, What's so important about it, Amen. and that's why I do talk to you about being careful what you say, because so much of what <coughs> takes place in your life in a negative way is because you've actually said it. Mm -hmm. And so, as you start to understand that and you start to control what you say, mm -hmm. you should stop a great deal of the problems that come into your life. Mm -hmm. You're not going to stop them all because some of them are attacks that are coming through the enemy, but a lot of them. It's actually you. Mm. You made it easy for me mm. by what you've said. So control your tongue. <clears throat> the protection bit. So Abraham's going to do it. He's there. He's got the knife. He's just about to stab his son. And an angel appears and says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad. The angel was sent to protect Isaac from his dad. And uh, as I was studying this, uh, I, I got a picture of what was taking place. Isaac's lying there when he's bound up, he can't move. Abraham's there with his knife. And an angel appears, and I can almost see him grabbing the hand with the knife. No, don't touch him. And it says, uh, lay not a hand upon the lad and then don't harm him. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a double thing to make certain he understood. Mm -hmm. right? So he stopped him. And as a consequence of that, Abraham turned to look from where the voice was coming from. Mm -hmm. This is what it says. Mm -hmm. And then it says he lifted up his eyes. Right? So 
If his eyes are down there, he's lifting up his eyes, he's looking up. Right? And he saw a ram caught in the thicket. And it says the ram was caught in the thicket by its horns. Right? So this is the very specific thing. I went through lots and lots of websites, lots of Jewish ones, lots of um, these uh, rabbis and everything, looking at all of this to see what, what was the old concept of this. It was caught by the horns, and apparently these, it was a ram, right? It was a male, young, sheep uh, type thing. And they're very careful when they're eating. When they go into thickets and things like that, the only part that goes in is the mouth. So they go in to, to chew the leaves. And so for a ram to get caught by its horns was almost unheard of. You see, because they, they were clever, they didn't want to get stuck in, so they'd go in as far as they... And so, and this ram, Abraham's had to look up to see it. And he's had to look up and look behind. Right? So, there's a ram that's caught behind him, high up, that he turns and sees it. Right? Now, he hadn't seen it before, had he? He didn't know it was there. So that suggests to me that that ram couldn't have been there for long. Because if you're a ram, and you're stuck in the thicket, right, you're going to be trying to get out. And they're pretty strong, aren't they? Right? So he'd have been making a noise, wouldn't he? Right? So if you're there just about to, you'd be oh, Ram, shut it. I'm trying to kill my son. Just keep it down a bit, will you? Yeah. Right? But he didn't do that. So it seems to me as though that Ram must have only just got there. Right? This is, this is what I'm going through in terms of thinking. The Ram's just got there. Now, our concept is that God has provided the Ram. Right? The ram is, as we know, the substitutionary sacrifice. That when uh, Isaac is spared, Abraham thinks, I, I need to make a sacrifice. And so, I need another sacrifice. Well, what we're going to find is that Abraham actually offered two sacrifices. The fact that he was willing to kill his son, God accepted that as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see? So he could have left it at that. He'd done what God had asked him to, and God said, that's okay, I can see that you, you intended to do it. As far as I'm concerned, that's good enough. I'll accept that as a sacrifice. And you know, there's lots of times in your life when God actually comes to you, and he's asking for you to give something up. He's looking to see whether you are willing to, and if you are willing to, that's good enough. So there can be lots of times when you don't have to actually give up that thing, you just have to be willing to give it up. Because of the idolatry thing, you see, this is, what, this is what it's about. If it's an idol, you won't be willing to give it up. If it's not an idol, you would be willing, but God says, it's okay, I can see it's not an idol to you, you can keep that. And in right. fact, you've just opened the door to multiplication, because I'm not, yeah, more of that. Because I can see it's not a problem to me. You see, this is a part of what I want you to see here. But in this situation, there's a ram that's behind me. And this ram's high up. What's a ram doing high up? Anybody ever seen on YouTube rams fighting? Yeah. What do they do? They rear up, don't they? And then they come down to Ed Bottom from a great height, don't they? What I think was taking place, I think that Abraham and Isaac were in this, the territory of this ram. Right? And it comes up behind him, and it's about to come down and headbutt him, right, to attack him. But the angel not only stops Abraham from killing Isaac, but it stops the ram and gets him stuck in the thicket. Because how did the, the ram get its, its horn stuck in the thicket when it normally only puts its mouth in to get the leaves? Right? I think what happened was when it reared up like that, when it's ever in the back, it stuck, its horns went into the thicket and it couldn't get out. And it was stuck. And it's there. And do you know what I actually found? Uh, there's a couple of 2,000 or 3,000 year old sculptures 
of ram stuck in the thickets, exactly like that. I found them afterwards, I, after us, found pictures of them that are in the museums. And so what I think was taking place was, it wasn't just God that was sending the ram, somebody else was sending it. Because you see, this was a cataclysmic event that took place in the spirit realm that enabled Jesus to come as Saviour. Do you think the devil just stood idly by, thinking, well, there's nothing much I can do about it? I'm going to try and stop this sacrifice. I'm going to send the enemy in to, to attack and, and, and stop him from doing it before he actually does the dirty deed. And so I think the ram was sent by Satan. Right? To stop this. And so, again, the principle I want you to see today is God, first of all, has to protect you before He can provide for you. And the very thing that is sent to destroy you could be the very thing that is the provision. Hallelujah. Because you see, the ram that was sent to destroy you was the ram that actually ended up being mm. offered as the sacrifice. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, and so one of God's principles is that He turns the attacks of the enemy against you to your benefit. Amen. Right? Thank you, Lord. And how is He able to do that? When you're worshipping. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because He was there in an act of worship, He didn't defend Himself. He didn't even know that he was there until he was caught behind him. You see, God fought on his behalf. We've heard many times, haven't we, that the battle wasn't his. The battle was the Lord's. And so in this situation, when you're worshipping, God turns that situation around. He turns the attack. And the, that very attack becomes the provision. Amen. And so quickly, we're going to have a look at that and then... On your next page, you'll find, uh, oh, first of all, at the bottom of that, Job 1.10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on it, every side? You'll find that hedges are a form of protection. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the shepherds of that day, if they were out and about, they weren't close to home, and they needed to make a, a corral or something, what they would do was they would try and get thorns. They would get... Uh, thorny branches and they would make it like a false hedge around about and they would leave a little entrance uh, and they put the sheep in the back and at the entrance they would put a fire and the sheep wouldn't go past because of the fire and none of the, uh, the attackers, no animals would come in, they couldn't get in because of the thorns and they wouldn't go because of the fire and that was the way that they used to put together a, a place like a, a corral. Uh, Psalm 91, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. This I declare about the Lord, He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. Amen. For He will rescue from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. Mm -hmm. He will cover you with His feathers, He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armour and protection. That sounds very much to me what took place at Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. The provision. So a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham has prophesied that the Lord would provide the lamb. And after obeying his, his instructions, his hand is stayed and he sees the provision. And again, remember, I've been talking to you about so many times God's provision can be there, but you don't see it. Mm -hmm. Right? And so you have to ask the Lord, what's the answer to this situation? Mm. You know, the number of times that I've faced situations, uh, like when my van broke down uh, nine months ago, the, the clutch, um, the, the fluid ran away, and so the clutch didn't work. And I've been trying to get it back from Macclesfield to Congleton. And I managed to get sort of two third, well, a third of the way, and then there was no clutch at all. And uh, the, 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 there used to be a way of driving where you could sort of uh, start the, the engine up in gear. Well, I'd been doing that, um, but I got to the point where it wouldn't even take that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I had to ring up a garage. 
and the garage that I've used a lot, they came out and helped me. Um, but lots of times you face a situation and the question is, who shall I contact? Uh, what shall I do? What, what do I need to do in this situation? And see, that, that's what you're looking for in terms of provision. Hallelujah. So you have to see the provision. So if you haven't got your provision in a particular area at this moment, ask the Lord to show you where it is. Right? Because it's there. And this is a part of what you've got to, uh, to have in this trust that God has promised that he will always meet your needs. He's going to do it by grace, mm -hmm. so we, that grace is released, and through faith. And so your part is the faith. Your part is, I believe it's there, somewhere there's a provision. God's already made provision for me, I've just got to see where it is. And, and so that's the aspect. You don't have to be um, praying and fasting really hard to twist God's arm to make provision for you. Right? If you're going to pray and fast, it's so that you can see where it is. That, that's what's taking place. Uh, and it might only be like a, a subtle little change in what you're doing. But when you do it, when you do that, then you'll start to see the provision that's there. And it's not your prayers that's making God provide for you. It's your prayers that are showing you the provision he's always made. Right? That, that's the little change that we need to get. So we don't think that the answer is always to go praying and fasting for six days to force God to meet my needs. Mm -hmm. Well, God doesn't respond to that. You might have to fast for 60 days or 600 days if you're going to try and force him because he's not going to yield to pressure, you see. <clears throat> okay. Um, there will be many times when the Lord not only protects us from attack but turns that attack into the provision that we need. And this theme was here in the worship and in what Sonny was bringing. Blessing follows battle, both physical and spiritual. Right? And so the spiritual battle, you've got to win the spiritual battle first before the blessing is released. And so there's a, a few scriptures I've got here for you to, to take a look at. I can't spend a lot of time on it because it's 20 past one already, you see. I didn't get up until pretty much half past. Um, the first one, 2 Kings chapter 7. Let's quickly look at that. 2 Kings chapter 7. You want to pray? I'll read it. I'll go through it pretty quick. Um, verse 5. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. This was four lepers that were outside of the, the city. And the city was under siege uh, and they were on the point of starving. And uh, there wasn't an army. The Lord just caused them to hear a sound, mm. to think there was an army, and they ran off. Yeah. You see, so the Lord protected them. And when they ran off, then the city went in and plundered that camp. Uh, and, and all of the stuff that was in that camp was there, that was provision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Next one, 2 Chronicles 20, 25. Similar kind of idea. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off them for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. And on the fourth day they assembled themselves in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that same place was called the Valley of Baraka unto this day. Because Baraka means blessing. And so what had happened here, this was when the three armies were coming against Israel and they sent the praise and worship team out in front of the army. Mm -hmm. Right? They didn't give you a machine gun, you had to take your guitar. Mm -hmm. And so the praise and worship team went out in front of the army and the Lord set ambushments and the armies mm -hmm. fought against each other mm -hmm. and killed each other. I've always asked the question, who was the last one? How did he die? Mm -hmm. Did he kill himself? Mm -hmm. No. 
<laughs> was he running away that quick? He just ran into a brick wall or something? How did they all die? Mm -hmm. I'm baffled as to how the last one bit the dust. But the consequence was that Israel didn't have to fight a battle. All they had to do was go in and pick up the spoil. You see. And so I want you to see that there is this sp spiritual battle that takes place. And the consequence of that is the people that have been sent to attack you fight against themselves yeah. and then all of their goods are released to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I told you about New Life. We went in there and, and we yeah. picked up all the stuff. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and what took place over at Fenton? Well, uh, in terms of the carpet and the chairs mm -hmm. and things like that are gone. Well, those kind of things can happen time and time again when you start to worship. See, the key was he, they didn't fight a battle, they sent the worship team in. And the enemies fought against each other. Now, what's taking place in Syria and Iraq at this moment in time, right? It's possible, I'm not saying this is the case, but it's possible that what is happening is exactly this. Remember, they are enemies of Israel and they are intent on destroying Israel. And so it could be that the Lord has got them fighting amongst themselves. Amen. You see, I'm not saying that for definite, but it's a, there is a possibility, because God has done that time and time before, mm -hmm. that the way he defends Israel is that Israel's enemies fight amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know how to pray for that situation, pray that they would get saved. Right? Pray that the, the people in that those foxholes, all of these Muslims that are fighting against each other, that they can't sleep and that they have dreams and they encounter Jesus in their dreams. Amen. That's the way to pray for them. Amen. Not necessarily that um, the warfare stops as such. Mm. This is a part of understanding how to pray over particular situations. Amen. Because if you're praying against God's will, then mm. he's not going to answer your prayer, is he? Yeah. So that's why you need the wisdom. Amen. Uh, 2 Samuel 3, 22. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. Um, after this, uh, this latest bunch of Muslims started attacking Iraq, um, they said on the television that they were the richest of these uh, uh, jihadists because they'd gone into Mosul and they'd taken all the money out of the banks. Well, that's a picture of exactly what I'm saying. You see, they've gone in and spoiled that city. They've taken all of the riches on that city and they're using it for their own purpose. Mm. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying God does for us. Mm. That you will face situations where, because of your worship, um, the spiritual battle it takes place, that God releases his angels to go out. Mm. He deals with the situation and then suddenly you have got uh, amazing amounts that come to you, uh, not just to make you rich as such, but uh, for the use of the kingdom, mm -hmm. you see. And, and I've seen it happen time and time again with when the cleaners giving up now me. When I go into areas, there comes a time when they give up and suddenly I get lots of customers, um, extra customers. Last bit and then we can finish, multiplication. And as I said to you, uh, the, this whole scenario it is actually, it's a doorway to multiplication. It's the testing ground. Because when I've taken you through this whole concept to do with man, of understanding that uh, God actually needs rich Christians, but he has to take them through being set free for the love of money, the love of man, mm -hmm. so that that money won't be a snare to you. It won't destroy you. Mm -hmm. Because having lots and lots of money can be such a temptation. You see, and I've come across a number of very rich men that have said that they found it very difficult to find someone that they can give a lot of money to, but it won't destroy them. And so your character has to be changed so that you've got to become that spiritual unit that I've talked about, so that when God starts to entrust you with his money, that you realise it is his money and you don't touch it. And you become a faithful steward. Yeah. So that everything that he wants to send to a pipeline into a situation yeah. gets there. You. That you don't get tempted to start hiving it off and, and, and using it for yourself. Yeah. But when you really tr truly believe that God's going to meet all your needs, um, that you, you can now become like a tenant farmer. Yeah. And, and God says, okay, 5% of all the production on this farm you can have. 
95% I'm having, and I'm going to put it straight into the kingdom. Right? And suddenly now you are overseeing uh, a hundred million pound farm, which means that 5% of 100 million is 5 million. That's a lot of money for you to live on. You know, you can be a very rich person. As long as you just obey and make certain the 95% goes to God. You see, it goes to the kingdom. And, and that's the key thing that's taking place in, a, in this. And that same principle has been what's happening with Abraham. Whether he would be faithful in giving back to God, mm -hmm. uh, Isaac, you see. And when he passes that test, then multiplication comes. And how does God release multiplication? He speaks it. Yeah. How does God bless you? He speaks it over you. And this is what takes place, isn't it? <clears throat> Verse 16. Uh, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Now see there, that's two things. Right? This is why there's a double blessing. Two sacrifices. But in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, Amen. and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Amen. Now you should know that scripture because that's pretty much uh, Genesis 12, 2. Yeah. Repeated, isn't it? Yeah. It's the blessing of Abraham mm -hmm. being restated. Mm -hmm. Right? And you know that the blessing of Abraham is for you because mm -hmm. you are Abraham's seed, don't you? Mm -hmm. You are uh, joint heirs. So he receives a double blessing because he offered the two sacrifices. Halloween. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to try and get through that fairly quickly because we started fairly late. Mm -hmm. But I want you to see, God is your provider and he is your protector. Mm -hmm. And many times, first of all, he will have to protect you against an, an attack. Mm -hmm. And when he does, when he defeats that attack, the consequences of that is that you actually receive everything that they brought with them. You see? And so God's provision can be there after the battle. And the, the battle is the Lord's, not yours. That your part to play is coming in that act of worship. And so you come and worship the Lord. You, if he asks you to sacrifice something that's important to you, do that knowing that, that has opened the door for you to actually have a multiplied number of that coming back to you. Mm -hmm. You see? Uh, and, and so in that, that enables God then to defeat those people that are coming against you. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you see, what could happen is that those people aren't defeated, that they come in, they attack you and they take away the very thing that you've tried to keep hold of. Because what you need to understand, if something's an idol, you will lose it. Right? This happens with family, it happens with husbands, it happens with children. If you make them more important than God, they become an idol. Yes. Mm. You see? Mm. And you lose them. Mm. So you're going to lose it one way or the other. Right? There's one way that if you lose it, if you give it to God, it comes back multiplied. Mm. If you keep all of it, mm. try not to give it to God, that you've lost it. But you lose it permanently.